We gotta leave early, that is okay, right? Yeah. Okay. You'll have homework to do. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. But we all need homework. Those next okay. reflection be so. Um, I'll be sure you get what you need to do. Okay, thank you. All right. So everyone's ready for the first question? All right. Describe your fondest memory of your family. Your fondest memory? Fondest, like something that you remember about your family. There's a whole or as a, however you describe your family. However you describe your family. Are we talking about the group or individually? Oh, it's probably just talking about how, If you want to do it individually, if you want to share it amongst your table, you guys need to kind of figure that out. Because keep in mind, this is low risk. Everybody doesn't have fond memories of their family. Are we just talking about it or writing it down? Talking about it and writing it down. If you choose to write it down, you're just sharing it out. Oh. 
We had said Thanksgiving dinner and all the family would get together back in the days when you had all your uncles and cousins and all that. Ah, grandmother. Skip the generation. Skip the generation. So, you know, when we think about our fondest memories of our families, I, I left it kind of vague because some people pick the media family, some people pick siblings, some people pick the larger group because we describe families so different. But those memories are like lasting and they help develop who you are. And if you think about it, some of the things that our younger, young adults um, put on and some of the things that adult, like us older adults, added, there's a like here and now, and just imagine their memories are your same lasting memories that you're talking about now, 20, 15 years later. So keep in mind, like as you think about families and what that looks like, you talk about traveling, you talk about game nights, all about togetherness and building relationships. But when she said that that's something that's the, the finest memory of her and her brother, it was that piece of unity. Oh, probably got in trouble together. Right. And that's that unity, regardless of what it is. Um, so, any thoughts about that? The next question. Your interactions with your family reflect those finest memories. So we talked about that earlier, but so how do you deal with your family? This might not be something everyone wants to share out. But how these interactions from here, how do they affect your current interactions with your family? So when you think of the one that I did, the one that I talked about, she said the car trips. In my memory, when I think of car trips, I think about us having to drive the far and both of my parents used to smoke. Uh, we used to be in there choking and dying. You know, I never smoked a cigarette a day in my life. Never ever. And I still, the fact that I still remember that 20 plus so think about some of the things that we talked about, um, those interactions, how do they reflect the one, how do you see your family, or for you younger folks, how do you want to embrace some of those same things as you think about them? I got over it, but like, I don't know if they know that we forgot, like me and my brother, um, but they like never talked to us about it. And like, like I'm still like holding a grudge to this day, but it's like, my mom is my mom is fine with the with the situation, but and I'm like I'm pretending to be okay with it because my mom is okay. I don't want to like cause that uh, friction between the family member and my mother. So um, and like for me, it's not like it's not like a big deal to like quote unquote put on like a big smile like all right, you know I'm I'm going because you're going, you know. And I don't feel like at this point, like even if she does like not expect like, well, you know, that was like uh, wrong or like that was a bad thing too, I'm like think like I'll even like be willing to forgive her. So uh, like this so a restorative principle is something called an affective statement. And it's a way that you don't usually think about that. When you think about restorative practice as a continuum, and it's this thing called an affective statement. And I use it with my children all the time. And I support my children to use it to be able to effectively communicate with the adults without being disrespectful. Because I believe that everybody, you're entitled to your feelings, and other people are entitled to not give a damn. So that's what I teach my kids. People, like, once I tell you how I feel, you have the right to say. So with an affective statement, I didn't bring any, I might have something in my bag to give you about an affective statement. But it was like an I feel statement. So they could say something like, um, you know, I'm making an uncle, uncle Jack, you know, I still feel hurt that you put my mom and my siblings out when I was like 10 years old. You know, I never had a chance to express this to you, and I want to move on from this, but I can feel I need to tell you that, that I still feel hurt about it. And I know with men, we don't like to admit them when you like to say they feel sad. Her, they, they, we don't like to use those. But once you express that, I had to learn that. With my affective statements, once I give an affective statement, I'm good. 
because I told you what you did to me, how it made me feel, and I told you what I needed to make this right, or we can work together to make this right. And if you choose not to make it right, I'm right with you because I told you how I felt, and I can walk away from it. And that's a lot of, we don't talk about these things, but that's part of healing, because we carry these things forever. And if some people don't even realize you're carrying this with them. But once you share it, you're releasing it. And it's a way for you to grow. So I've been, when I learned about these affective statements, when I started doing this recorded stuff, I was just dropping them on everybody. I was like, this is not crazy. Because once I tell you how I feel, I'm not even mad about it. people still mad. I ain't mad. I'm good. And I didn't disrespect you because I'm entitled to how I feel. And I realized that you're entitled to not giving it. But I, that's kind of what I teach my kids. So I always did the school because my children believe in affective statements with teachers about how they feel, you know, or they feel like the teacher feel like she was disrespected and then she repeats back what she said. I'm like, because of what? Like my daughter told somebody she felt that the teacher was, that she felt that something she said was a racist statement. So it went back that she told, the teacher went back and told the principal my daughter calls her a racist. Anyway, affective statements, look them up. And Time out. Just think about it. Just think about it. Formulate what happened. How you feeling about it? What do you need to do to make it better with that person? And share with them. Oftentimes, we only recognize the feeling, right? And so, if we're in a conversation or an altercation or a situation with another person, and a feeling gets stirred up, primarily people's you know first reaction is to say, "You did something to me." Because I'm feeling this feeling, and, and it's because you said something. But doing that, that, accus that accusational kind of statement puts, the, puts people at the, on, on, a, on a defensive thing because they might not even know that they triggered something. And so I think that's what a lot of people get hung up. And I think to the young lady that was talking earlier, uh, when we talk about learning something over time, I think that's part of the process that happens over time is to start to realize that you may be offended, I'm not talking about you specifically, but we may be offended or hurt or feel attacked or pain, but the other person may have no clue that they did right. such and such, or that they right. even had that impact. And I think what happens a lot of times is people just blow up. And it, it just came to mind when everybody was talking about family arguments and fights that happen because people don't know how to go back and think about, okay, what was it in me that was triggered and how can I just talk from my feelings? Um, going back to this whole parent and young thing, I realized like the generational gaps. And along with those generational gaps, it's like informational gaps, how we all, our perspective on life more or less. Because I can just contest from my upbringing, I seem like completely different than what my parents did and what they wanted to be. And the whole structure of life. And the youth feel as though they're not being heard because what it is, like what they teach us in society, I'm with the society at home and whatever the case is, they teach you to just, the parents are always right, listen to your elders, respect your elders. But then when I start to really think about it, I realize that we all share the same space. So being that we share the same space, we have to give the same compassion even to the younger people, even when we think we're right as older people, you know what I mean, as parents, because their feelings need to be validated their ideas and their thoughts need to be validated as well. And when they are not validated, that's when there's resistance. And that resistance is what draws that barrier between communication between young and old. Like, I guess that's what we see nowadays because the young people don't even care. I'm not going to speak for everybody, but it's like, I know I don't care what the old people tell me, but I really need to listen to them just from the, per se, from the experience. So that way that I didn't have the experience. You know what I mean? And that's what we can do for the youth. Nowadays, we can do what we do as a guide to them, but not more or less authoritatively, but as like just shining light on things that they may want to stay away from and things that they need to understand. So that way they don't approach the adult with unknowing of the mental health issues and all these other things that you see running rampant around society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as an older mom, I feel like I'm an older mom because I'm. Like, I was like, I'm an old, because I'm an older mom. But, um, <laughs> but one thing that, since I've been like, I mean, 
and you guys at your age, you'll see as you grow, you'll go through different phases, you know, like the 30 phase, the 40 phase, the 50 phase, or maybe the 55 phase. But anyway, so like with my kids, last year what I did was um, I conducted a 360 with myself with my kids. And the 360, I mean, they, they got to vent. You know, I'm like, what kind of mom am I? How would you like me to be a better mom? How can I support you more? You know, without doing Snapchat, because I don't know you don't want me on that. But anyway, but I mean, I, I seriously opened up to their feelings. It was hard, you know, to for them to reiterate the way I, I parent, you know, and, but it was, it was cool because I got like honest feedback. I got some good stuff and some stuff I need to work on. So in working on that, what we created was a family text. So like what I was first saying, whenever we go through something, all three of us, or I guess it's four of us, when we go through something, we'll put it in the text, which is their way of communicating, right? And sometimes it's easier for them to say what they need to say without being in your space. You know what I mean? Or looking like, you know what I mean? Or it might, and it'll come out. So that's how that's how we um, that's how I do it. That's the newer version of that letter writing. Yeah, yeah, that's how I do it. So, right. so one more question, and it's the gift. So as we see, we're like a global family, right? We're all a part of this space. We share spaces. Um, so when you think about the global global family, what are the gifts that you have to give to your family? to your community, to your city, and to your village. Because all of these build up this global family that we have. And sometimes we're walking through life like and missing that we're part of this big global community. And I kind of like this conversation, so like, we had each other opportunity, young and old, to engage in conversation that some of us might even reflect back about like, well, I need to go home and talk to my kids about some of this stuff too. Or, you know, I'm listening to my teenagers because I like to do the same thing that they're sitting and talking about and I'm not even recognizing it. So it, even as adults, you know, we think about our relationships with our kids and our parents and um, our co-workers, which is still a part of our extended family. We don't want to believe it. Like, I just go to work and go home. I don't care who's in there. But everybody in your family knows every co-worker that gets on your dog on nerves. Right? They know them by name. My sisters are teachers. I know all the kids are driving crazy by name. So the reality is that every they're a part of our family. So how are we able to kind of deal with that? And what is the plan that we're making to be able to do that? So our gift, like what gift do we have to give? So um, if it's communication, if it's the gift of compassion, you know, what if it is the gift of listening? Because listening is a gift. You ever have a time like people like people want to come and tell me everything? And it's like you're not saying anything. I'm listening. Like what do you want? You don't want me to tell you what to do. I'm just listening. You don't want to hear what I got to say anyway. So I'm just listening. But that's a gift. And sometimes people don't realize that you're giving them a gift, just giving them the opportunity to talk. Like this is a gift, right? I'm giving people the opportunity and the space to talk about things and think about things with people who aren't in the room. Uh, you're thinking about people that aren't in the room, but you're discussing it with somebody that you may never see again. Or you're hearing conversations that are coming from your kids or your grandkids, or things that you might get like, like I might be able to step in and help with that. With my own family, this conversation had nothing to do with your family, but you're hearing it and you're like, oh, maybe I need to go and talk to my son about his relationship with his daughter. Or this new little chick, chick that he got that I really don't like, and I, I need to express myself about it. Because she coming over one Sunday, and I gotta act like I like it. You know, and that's real. Everybody knows that you don't like it. You don't want to act like you don't. So how can we do with these things? So the purpose of this conversation is just to kind of stir up and to begin to generate, you know, what real communication should look like amongst all these families, whether it's your, you know, the global family, the family, the community, the city, and your village. Because in order for us to move around this, you know, like. He asked me, like, what does this have to do with Black Lives Matter at school? School is part of the global family. And hurt and trauma 
right? Dysfunction. It all comes from this global family that we have. And if we don't talk about these things in a way to kind of feel a sense of relief or with solution, what we found is that you the solution, not the problem. If we're not part of the solution, we are the problem. So putting yourself in these positions, like those three things you gotta think about, that's you coming up with solutions to things that we don't wanna identify as problems. Right, because we all have these family dynamics. You know, I didn't tell all my family business here on this tape, but it gets much worse. My kids hate when I talk about her. Um, you know, how can we move forward from this? So I want you to keep in mind those three commitments that you wrote or you archived in your brain, as well as your gifts, because it's important that we're committed to building this global family, to sustain, you know, this, this village, because we're all a part of it. You know, like, and what are we doing to give a gift? Like, I just got to give. That's your son? I heard him speak the other night, <coughs> and he, he was a blessing to me. It's really nice to see positive young men that are able to speak in spaces that weren't necessarily fit for children. I mean, young adults, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> young adults. But he was able to speak in a way that he grabbed my tools. He came from my side. Ah. Oh, that's his sister, that's his mom. So to me, for me, that's a gift. Like I'm giving you a gift to let you know that you've done a good job from what I've seen on your son. And people don't tell you that every day. You only hear the negative. You know, so those are the things that are important. How often are we being intentional about that? You know, like for you, I, I'm gonna find an aspect of the statement for you to work out that. Well, I'm gonna show, I didn't give the name, I don't know who it is. But those things are important. How intentional, how intentional are we with that? You know, these young ladies being the city here and speaking, because I is not here, but able to engage them in conversation. She, she, you don't know this, you don't know this, See, they don't know. So she was able to engage in conversation. The mom and daughter here reminds me of me and my daughter. You know, and reminding me, like this, this, but I guess I gotta go home and call my mom. This is reminding me to call my mom. <laughs> you know, that's the important thing. You know, so we have to continue to think about that and be okay with gifting people. And it's not always tangible. We're in a society that everything, you got to think about money or something of substance. But your feelings and those intrinsic rewards are all substance as well. Right. So, I'm done. Anybody have any thoughts or a gift they want to share with someone else before we leave the space? All right, one word check out. Different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding, I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities. Different mentality. It, it, it seems hard. hard. It seems it challenging. Seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else, else is a challenge. Is a challenge. Is a challenge. Um, so, 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 I'm ready for, I'm this, ready challenge. for this challenge. And I was built, and I was for, built this. for this. I think that, I think that we all have a purpose in life. life. And mine's going to take on a task that, that most of us back away back from. Back away that, from. Impossible. that impossible. Some people, people say it's impossible. impossible. I, see I see possibilities. possibilities. I, don't see I don't see anything as impossible. being impossible. Mentalities, there are different mentalities, but.